What is going on, Cuse Nation? Welcome to yet another edition of Orange Heat. <laughs> My name is Giovanni Heater, as always, and thank you so much for joining me. It is an honor today. It is a very special day in the history of Orange Heat as we are joined. Today, we welcome Syracuse basketball legend, six foot four guard out of Bay City, Michigan, number 23, Eric Devendorf. He averaged 15.7 points per game in his final season at Syracuse, and he ranks 14th on the school's all-time scoring list with 1,680 career points. Eric, thank you so much for joining us. Well, I appreciate you having me, man. Of course. How are you? I, I have to be the typical interviewer these days and ask you, how are you keeping yourself busy throughout this uh, pandemic craziness? I'm good. Um, you know, staying safe, you know, trying to listen to – um, you know, what all the experts are saying, staying home and, um, you know, the family's safe, I'm safe. Um, so just trying to stay busy. Uh, you know, I've, I've been putting out some videos and stuff for, for the kids. So, um, you know, just trying to keep positive and, and, and spread some positivity, obviously, during a, a time where it's hard to be positive. Absolutely. That's great to hear. I've seen all your stuff on uh, Twitter and Instagram, putting out basketball videos uh, for the young kids and, and older guys as well to get out there and get active and uh, just, just play some ball, do what they love to do uh, as you always did. So uh, my plan for the interview today is we'll just go through your career. We'll start with your youth. Uh, we'll touch upon your high school career, obviously uh, spend a chunk of our time at your playing days at Syracuse. Uh, then we'll, we'll touch upon your overseas play a little bit, your coaching career, and, and what you're up to now. Sound good with you? Yeah, sounds good. All right, all right. So, uh, you know, without further ado, getting into it, my first question for you is, is pretty simple and straightforward. What was your first introduction to the game of basketball? Um, well, my first introduction was from my dad. My dad, um, he didn't play – uh, you know, college or pro, I think he might have played high school, but, um, you know, he's the one who put the ball in my hands. Um, and, and really from there on, it was just kind of, um, you know, I, I really loved it. You know, I just, as a young kid, I just remember being outside playing every day um, in the rain, you know, in the snow, it didn't really matter. But, um, you know, my father, he was the one who introduced it to me and, and really gave me that passion for the game. Um, and it's really stuck with me, um, you know, obviously until now. That's awesome. Now, now, what about the game of basketball is it that you love? Um, for me, I, I'm a competitive guy. I love the competition. Um, you know, I love going against the other guys who, who have a passion for it like I do. Um, you know, and, and I like the challenge. You know, it's, it's every time you go out there, um, you know, facing a tough opponent, um, it, it's a challenge. Or, you know, even when you're outside by yourself, you know, it's a challenge, you know, whether you're um, you know, competing, doing a drill or, uh, you know, just just trying to hit a mark that maybe you could get better from the last time you did it. So, uh, you know, I love the challenge. I love the competitiveness. And, um, uh, you know, it's just it's just the passion that I have for the game. It's it's always been there. And, uh, you know, um, hopefully you can pass it down to, uh, you know, this next generation coming up. Absolutely. Was there any specific players in your youth just, just watching on TV or in your community that really had an influence on you? Who did you model your game after? Um, you, my favorite player growing up was Allen Iverson. Uh, you know, I, I just loved his, his uh, passion and his competitiveness and his will, his drive. He, he never backed down, you know, uh, you know, being that little, going to the basket, getting knocked down, getting right back up, you know, getting in guys' faces, you know, really had no fear. So I kind of, um, you know, try to model my game after that as far as um, having no fear and, and um, you know, attacking the basket, um, you know, not worried about you're getting your shot block or getting fouled or getting knocked down. Um, and then if you do, and just continue to get up and, and keep on playing. So um, I always had that with me and I always tried to keep that with me is, is playing with no fear um, and never backing down. That's really interesting that you say that, you being a Syracuse guy yourself and Allen Iverson attending Georgetown, a little rivalry there, but really interesting. Uh, I can see the comparison a little bit, just, just the way you guys play with your heart. You know, uh, it's really, really cool that you say that. Um, now, growing up in the Bay City area, had you ever watched Syracuse basketball before? Were you even familiar with Syracuse athletics? Obviously, we were on TV um, during your youth, but were you really familiar with Syracuse or a fan at all? Um, I, you know what? Not too much. Uh, I, growing up, I really, 
what I was watching was the Detroit Pistons and then, um, you know, obviously Michael Jordan. So I, I was a big Pistons fan growing up. So for me, it was more NBA than college. Um, actually, my first time um, really paying attention to Syracuse um, was in uh, 2003, the championship year. I was, I was committed to Michigan State, but Syracuse ended up playing at Michigan State that, that season and I was at the game. So um, that was really the first time that I, I really – locked in with Syracuse and, and really love the style of play. And, um, you know, obviously seeing GMAC and Mello out there and Hakeem work, um, it just fit, you know, how, how my game and how I played. So that was really, um, you know, when I took a, a liking to Syracuse was probably in 2003. And, um, you know, after that, um, it was, uh, you know, it was just a fit. Wow. Wow. Now, uh, you made the move from Bay City to attend Oak Hill Academy in Virginia, ultimately becoming a McDonald's All-American in 2005. What has Oak Hill meant to you, and how has that decision influenced your career to make that move? Obviously, following in the footsteps with players in the likes of Carmelo Anthony, Billy Edelin, and Deshaun Wright, Syracuse greats. Yeah, well, I think Oak Hill really, um, you know, prepared me for the next level. Going to Oak Hill, it was already like a college type atmosphere, um, you know, staying in the dorms and, um, you know, competing against the best players in the country, the best high, high school players at that time. And, um, you know, on my team, I had Kevin Durant and, and Ty Lawson. So um, you can imagine, you know, the practices that we were having a lot of the times were more competitive than, uh, you know, the other teams we were playing against. So that definitely, uh, you know, helped me get ready for college. And, and uh, I think, you know, going there for that year, um, you know, really uh, up my game a little bit. And then, um, you know, as far as like the traveling and, and all that goes, we were traveling like we were a college team. So, um, you know, by the time I got to Syracuse, I was already used to it. Wow. Wow. That's that's really cool playing on the same team, Kevin Durant. That, that's really mm -hmm. awesome right there. Now, uh, talking about Oak Hill and everything, and you kind of mentioned it a little bit before with the Syracuse Michigan State game, but just briefly walk me through your recruiting process. Um, so at, for my recruiting process, it really started to heat up, um, you know, probably, uh, ninth grade year. Um, you know, I played varsity in my ninth grade, my ninth grade year. And then in that summer I played AAU, um, for a team called Michigan Hurricanes. Um, and then being able to get out on the circuit and play all over the country, you know, in front of different college coaches. Um, and, and I did well. So that, that's really when the letters started to pour in, um, you know, I was getting offers from from all over the country, uh, Louisville, uh, Michigan, Michigan State, Florida. Um, so, you know, I really had a lot of attention from, um, you know, all the high major schools. And I really had my choice. Um, and like I said, early on, I committed to Michigan State. I think, um, you know, at that time, um, that's kind of what the guys were doing. The best players in the state were going to either Michigan or Michigan State. So um, I committed to Michigan State pretty early. But like I said, um, you know, when I was able to attend that game and kind of see, you know, see uh, how Syracuse was playing and, and, and also another school that was high on my list was Florida. Um, you know, those, those were kind of two similar systems and how they played getting up and down. So, um, yeah, I just, I just felt like that, that fit me more. And um, uh, I remember committing to Syracuse. I think it was going into my uh, senior year in the summer um, at ABCD camp. So. Um, you know, the recruitment process was crazy. You know, I was getting, you know, 30, 50 letters a day in the mail. And um, I still got all those letters you know, somewhere at my mom's house. So it was a pretty cool experience to kind of, you know, every young kid wants to experience that and feel wanted from, from those type of schools and especially at that high level. And so it was a pretty cool experience, man. You know, we got coaches coming into my school, talking to me and things like that. Um, specifically, I remember Tom Izzo coming in and Billy Donovan coming in. So um, yeah, I, I had a pretty, uh, pretty ex cool experience um, with the recruiting. Wow, that's, that's really cool. Now, you talked about Florida, you talked about Michigan State, and I know you touched upon it, you know, talking about Carmelo and the system and everything, but on a coaching level with Bayheim and Mike Hopkins, why Syracuse? Uh, I mean, well, honestly, um, at first, I, you know, the coaches, they were cool, but I was looking at the style of play, you know, it. I knew wherever I was going to go in, I was going to make sure I, I got my playing time, just, just, you know, me competing. And, and I wasn't going to let somebody, you know, take that from me. So, um, 
yeah, honestly, I wasn't even thinking about the coaching at first. You know, I I just knew I wanted to play in that system, and, and I knew I was going to come in and uh, and do what I had to do. Um, but then as I, you know, started to um, get to know Coach Hop and, and Coach Beheim more, um, just a, a different respect for them, how they knew the game and their knowledge of the game. And, and obviously, me being younger, still learning the game, um, just learned a whole lot um, detail-wise and, and how they – you know, break the game down offensively and defensively and uh, definitely helped me throughout my career and, and, and uh, still to, to, to today. Awesome. Now, I call this next little bit thrown into the fire, okay? You got your first career start as a freshman, still in the non-conference portion of the 2005 season against Siena. You went on that year to average 12.9 points per game in your freshman campaign. What was that like for you, and how did both your confidence and your role change on the team as the year went on? Well, yeah, you know, I was never a guy who lacked confidence. So um, I think just going into my freshman year, that's what I expected that on myself to be able to go out there and play. Um, you know, in, in practice, I had to obviously prove it to the coaches. But um, again, I never was one to lack confidence. So, um, you know, having that success early on, it was it was what I expected from myself. And, um, you know, obviously, when you do well, um, especially younger, and you start to uh, you know, build that confidence more and more, um, you know, you'll, you'll have more success. I think, you know, a lot of the time, you know, when a player has a super amount of confidence, it can up their game even more. Um, so um, for me, having that success early, it, you know, it, it really helped my confidence even more than, you know, I already had. Absolutely. Now, in your first year at Syracuse, you also had the opportunity to share the court for a year with none other than Syracuse great Jerry McNamara. Jerry being a guy who had won a national championship, played the 2-3 zone and the guard position for three years up to that point, and had been just on about every single national stage possible in his four years at Syracuse. Can you speak about the relationship that you two shared, and what was it like learning from an experienced senior in Jerry with you being a young freshman yourself? Well, I was super lucky to you know, have GMAC by my side and um, learn from him and, and still to this day, one of my really good friends, um, you know, I was actually just talking to him yesterday, but um, yeah, man, I, I was lucky to be able to have him on my side. Like you said, a guy who's been through, you know, every stage, having won a national championship and, and, and been in a lot of different situations. So um, I was able to pick his brain and, and talk to him about, you know, what should I expect? And, um, you know, he, he, he really relaxed me, um, so to speak. Um, and, and, you know, I think, a lot of times guys coming in worry about, hey, what is, what if this happens, what if that, whatever it is. But um, he was able to kind of, uh, you know, give me some tips and, and relax me. And, and it just allowed me to go out there and play. And um, it was a heck of an experience to be able to play with him for, for one season. That's awesome. Okay, Eric, it's the beginning of your sophomore year at this point at Syracuse. McNamara is gone. The two guards running the show now are you and some kid from Jamesville named Andy Routens. How did your role on the team change after Jerry's departure? And did it really become your team to lead at that point? Um, well, I mean, I, I was definitely one of the leaders on the team, but then we had other, um, you know, senior leaders and Demetrius Nichols, Terrence Roberts, um, you know, guys who have, who have been through it and experienced it. Um, so, you know, I think we all tried to um, come together as a team and each have that um, important role. Um, I was probably one more of the vocal guys and, and I definitely tried to, um, you know, lead by example, going out there and play. Um, you know, I, a lot of guys can talk it, but they don't go out there and, and really do it. So, um, yeah, it was definitely a step up for me that next year. Um, and, you know, having played with GMAC, um, you know, that year before, it really helped me be able to step into that role more so and, and give me the confidence to, um, you know, speak and be vocal, um, you know, around older guys as well. So. Um, I was happy to, to be able to step into that role. And, um, you know, it really helped me going forward. That's great. Now, you had an opportunity to be a part of some of the most memorable games in Syracuse basketball history. What game did you look forward to most every year? Was it playing Georgetown in the big rivalry? Was it playing Villanova? Was it UConn? What team always seemed to bring out the best in you? Um, I don't really know if it was a sp specific team. I, I really enjoyed you know, every game. But I think um, for me, what was the most exciting was playing in Madison Square Garden. So every game that was 
um, that we were able to play in the garden. Um, you know, I always got a little extra hyped up for that. Um, you know, obviously all the history that goes there and, and everything that has, you know, been there besides basketball with the boxing, music, whatever it is, it's just a lot of history. And um, it was, uh, I was super grateful to be able to play there and, and, you know, more than a few times a year. So, uh, you know, every time we got there, it was like you were on stage and you had those bright lights in New York City. So, um, you know, I always got excited to play there. Awesome. Now, now speaking of stadiums here, where was the toughest place to play when you were in college on the road? Uh, the two toughest places for me were um, probably uh, Pittsburgh. Pittsburgh was a tough place. They had Oakland a, Zoo. Yeah, their fans were uh, they were on you, and it was uh, they had a good crowd and a good atmosphere. And then probably another place uh, was Stores, and it was uh, their their uh, gym was right on campus and. Um, I could I could remember just getting off the bus and and everyone you know, all the Connecticut fans were just waiting there for you to you know say what they say. So those those were probably the two uh, you know toughest places to play. You know they they did a great job with their fans and their atmosphere and and really making it um, you know a home court advantage for their team. Absolutely. Those of you that don't know, Stores, Connecticut, home of the UConn Huskies. So. Pittsburgh and Connecticut were the two big games on the road that uh, Eric Devendorf not necessarily struggled with, but the crowd always played a factor. And that must have revved you up, though, even more to compete. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's that's a part of the game, to be able to have um, the fans there and uh, yelling at you. It just it just adds to, you know, um, you know, what the game is. You know, the fans are a part of it. And, and when they start getting on you, um, you know, for me as a player, I loved it. Um, it, it just gave me a little bit more energy and, and, you know, sometimes I go back and forth from a little bit, but, um, like I said, it was all a part of the game and, and, um, you know, the fans made it that much better. Awesome. Now, what is the biggest basketball game that you've ever played in? Was it a big East championship? Was it the six overtime? Which one? Uh, well, I mean, I guess it depends on how you look at it. The biggest games are always the championship games, but the, probably the, um, the best and most uh, recognizable game that I played in was the, obviously the six over t- time game versus Connecticut. Um, you know, I still get questions asked about that every day. Um, so uh, yeah, it was, it was super awesome to be a part of that. Um, you know, obviously, you know, going into uh, two days with one game and uh, six OTs, arguably the, you know, the, the greatest college basketball game of all time. So to be a part of that, not only to be a part of that, but to be able to get that win, um that was that was pretty awesome I know uh you know on the other side they're not talking about it as much as <laughs> as we would be here at Syracuse yeah so talking about that six overtime UConn game uh walk me through just what was going on in your head through that was it fatigue was it let's get this thing over with or was it we gotta we gotta keep cranking out a win here because Syracuse was actually the underdog in that game if I'm not mistaken yeah, well, I mean, the mindset was just stay locked in, stay focused. Um, you know, we, we wanted to come out with a victory. Um, obviously, we didn't want to be on the other end like UConn was. And, and like I said, um, they're not talking about it too much. They don't they don't want to hear about that 6 OT game. So, um, you know, I just remember all, everyone was locked in after each overtime, we, you know, talking to each other, encouraging each other to stick with it and, um, you know, do what we had to do on both ends of the floor. So, um, yeah, that was that was the whole mindset was just, just staying locked in, staying focused, and, and, and getting that win. Awesome. Now, similar to how UConn must feel with that six-overtime game, is there any specific game in your college career that you lost and you would love the opportunity to go back and play again and catch a win? Um, yeah, probably probably the Sweet 16 when we lost to, to Blake Griffin in Oklahoma. I mean – yeah. Obviously, you, if you, at every loss, you try to go back and uh, fix some stuff and so we could get the win. But, um, you know, those NCAA tournament games obviously are, are much more important. And to go back to be able to get those wins and get that win and um, advance to play get a chance to play against North Carolina, uh, you know, that definitely would have been, um, you know, one of the tops on my list. Absolutely. Now, Eric, after your career at Syracuse, you were granted a fifth year of eligibility following your devastating uh, knee injury after just 10 games in the 2007-2008 season. So what caused you to forego that fifth year and ultimately enter the NBA draft? Well, I had some stuff going on off the floor. I, uh, my daughter was born. Um, so, you know, it was up to me to be able to 
uh, you know, take care of them and, and be able to make some money. So ultimately that was um, what guided my decision. Um, it definitely would have been great to be able to come back and, uh, you know, break the scoring record for the school and, and do all that. Um, but, um, you know, at that time, I had to do what I had to do, and, and uh, that's how things worked out. But it's, you know, it's great to talk about it and, and kind of look back on, you know, what, what could have happened. But, um, yeah, that was kind of uh, what guided my decision to, um, to go pro. Absolutely. And, and no matter what, I think, uh, you know, your name's definitely engraved in every Syracuse fan's heart, and your name's definitely in the record books, no matter what. So, uh, leading into the next question, how different was it playing overseas compared to playing college basketball or even a little bit of NBA basketball here in the United States? Well, now it's a business, you know, it's, it's, it's money involved and, and uh, people are paying you. So, you know, if you're not doing your job, it, it can get pretty cutthroat, right? Like at any job, if you're not um, producing and doing what you're supposed to do, um, you, you'll get fired, right? So um, in, in overseas, it's, it's a little bit more so because um, they have guys coming for your job, you know, all the time. So um, if you're not winning games or if you're not producing like you're supposed to do, then, um, you know, they, they'll cut you or they'll fire you and they'll get somebody else in there. So, um, you know, the biggest thing is just it's a business now. So um, it's 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 something you get paid for and you got to understand that you can't, you know, you know, get in your feelings and, and, and things like that. Um, you got to understand the, biz the business part of it. So. Um, you know, it, it can be tough, you know, especially being overseas, you're away from your family. And um, if, if you're struggling or whatnot, um, you know, you just kind of just go home to yourself, you know. So, um, you know, it, like I said, it's tough, but it's that's how the business is. Absolutely. It's it's interesting. Is that kind of the same mentality in the NBA as well? Uh, well, I think it's different in the NBA because these contracts are uh, – guaranteed I mean even overseas they're supposed to be guaranteed but um, you know I think a lot of the times these teams overseas it doesn't matter if it's guaranteed there's they still won't pay you um, but you know NBA you have a little bit more um, I think leeway as far as um, you being able to get your money um, if you are cut so uh, teams are thinking about that more so because you know they have to pay you here um, here in the in the United States um, so the NBA is a little bit um, better with is well I would say a lot more better with with paying you and, and being able to get your money on time and, and all that absolutely you must have performed well over there and won some big games though because you had quite the lengthy overseas career yeah absolutely I, I had some I had some success overseas and you know a great experience being able to play in different countries I was in you know New Zealand Australia Turkey um, Ukraine just to name a few so um, not only um, did I get to play basketball and, and get paid for it, I got to, you know, experience different cultures and different countries. And, uh, you know, not a lot of people get to do that. Awesome, Eric. Now, tell me, walk me through this. What happens when Eric Devendorf hits the court? Is it like flipping a switch? Oh, yeah, absolutely. It's, it's a, you know, once I'm in between those lines, it's um, anything goes. You know, we're, we're out there competing and you could be my mom or – or my sister, it doesn't matter. I'm trying to win. I'm trying to beat you. So, um, you know, obviously I'm not cheating or doing anything like that, but, um, you know, once we get in between those lines, no friends, we're, we're going at it a hundred percent. So, um, you know, leave your feelings to the side and, and, uh, let's go out there and compete. And, and then when we go back off the court, um, you know, we can, we can be friends and, and talk and do all that. But when we're on the court, it's a, yeah, it's a whole different story. And I think that's why everybody loves watching you play. Eric, I know that you are known for getting emotional on the court in the best ways. That's that passion and intensity that we love watching you play for. But I have to know, what are you actually saying to the opposing teams out there as PG as you can make it? Uh, what I'm, I mean, just saying whatever, really. I mean, <laughs> something to get under their skin. I mean, it, it changes every moment. Um, Something, something might pop into my head and make a shot feeling good. Um, you know, so you talk a little trash to them. So um, it, it, it could be something different every time, man, but it's more so um, to, to kind of get myself going. Uh, I'm not really too much worried about, about what the opponent is. So, but on the other hand, when the opponent starts talking, it, it's the same way it gets me going as well. So I kind of like that back and forth. It, it's what I, uh, what I grew up, what I grew up playing like and, um, so it's just kind of something that that was a part of my game. Awesome. 
I'm kind of the same way I play lacrosse and I, I you know, chatter happens on the field uh, for sure. Absolutely. 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 That's the fun of it. Right. Right. All right. So are there any specific players that you always seem to kind of step on the toes of during your playing days, both college and overseas and even at the TBT tournament, which we'll get into in a moment, any guys that you always seem to get into it with? Uh, I don't know uh, a particular guy, maybe uh, more so with the Big East teams. I remember, you know, always the rivalries like UConn and Georgetown um, always seem to be a little bit more intense um, and, and a little bit more talking going back and forth. So, um, yeah, those teams. And then in the TBT, it's yeah, it's really whoever. Steve Burt? Um, oh, that's my guy. Steve yeah. Steve Burt's my guy. It's it, When we're talking, it's more so, uh, you know, friendly chatter. It's nothing okay. – it's nothing – you know, it's nothing bad. Um, but yeah, man, it's now, nowadays it's more, um, just kind of friendly chatter and more so back in college when it was, um, me maybe trying to get under your skin or or saying stuff that you don't like. Um, so yeah, I guess I've, um, you know, matured in my trash talk a little bit. (laughs) Nothing wrong with that. Right. Okay, so once again, it's been awesome to have the opportunity to watch you dominate on the court these last four years with this whole summer tournament. Um, What has Bayheim's Army and TBT meant for you, and how long are we going to get to see you around in an orange jersey? Uh, Well, TBT has been awesome, man. Um, You know, to be able to get back for those few weeks and team up with, um, you know, some of the older guys and then some of the newer guys, it's it's pretty awesome. It just kind of goes to show – you know, Syracuse is, is one big family and, um, you know, how united those guys are, you know, even if you played, if you didn't play with them, you know, they come back and it feels like you, you know, that's your brother regardless. So, um, and then obviously being able to, um, have the Syracuse fans come back and and watch us, it's kind of nostalgia for them, right. And to have their old players mixed with the new players, it's, it's, um, you know, the best of both worlds. And, uh, you know, it, mean, it means a lot to me to be able to still get out there and compete because I still love to do it. Um, so I guess I'll, I'll continue to do it as, as long as my body lets me. Awesome. Now, as we're starting to get closer to the end here, what's your most memorable moment in an orange jersey? Um, well, it has to be the 6 t game. Um, that's, you know, being able to play in, in arguably one of the best college basketball games of all time. Um, you know, super grateful and thankful for that experience. And then, you know, it, it was on ESPN. It was against our rival. It was in um, the Big East tournament at Madison Square Garden. So um, you have all those factors. Um, and then just adding that it was, you know, a 6 OT game. It was it was an awesome experience. And, and like I said, it's something that, um, you know, we'll be talking about really forever. Absolutely. Now, Getting into out of your playing days, your coaching journey. Where did this coaching journey begin? Um, I think it was me just wanting to stick with the game of basketball. You know, I I never really had a uh, a regular job, so to speak. It was always something to do with basketball, and I always knew that that's where I wanted to be and w- what I wanted to do. So, um, and I love you know teaching and, and uh, you know kind of sharing the knowledge that I learned. Um, with these these younger kids so that's kind of where it all started and um, you know I like interacting with these young guys I I still play with them and uh, I'm able to connect with them Um, and I think uh, it's easier to connect when you can kind of still do it and get out there and show them it's not like you're just blowing smoke Um, so um, yeah it was it started there um, and then it kind of I got opportunity um, at Syracuse uh, with Coach Beheim for a few years and then I got a opportunity at at Detroit Mercy with with uh, coach Davis and and now um, you know I'm kind of taking it into my own hands where I'm um, doing my own training with camps and clinics and one-on-one stuff and um, you know like I said just want to be able to stay in basketball and kind of share my knowledge and and what I learned um, you know from some of the um, smartest basketball minds in the world um, you know with this younger generation so now you know if they want to you know, be a coach or, or be a basketball player, they kind of have the, um, the knowledge to go forward with it. And, and if they're, you know, ever run into something, then they know how to deal with that um, from the knowledge that they've got from me or whoever it may be. Absolutely. You briefly spoke about uh, your opportunity at Syracuse University. Now, both in your college playing days and at your time coaching with Syracuse on the strength and conditioning staff, 
How was learning from great coaches like obviously Jim Beheim, Mike Hopkins, Adrian Autry, and even G Mac was a coach with you as well um, when you were coaching at Syracuse? How did those guys shape you into the coach that you've become? And how have you learned from them how to handle players, how to teach players, and really make them enhanced students of the game? Yeah, well, I mean, it was, I was like a fly on the wall being able to soak up all that knowledge from all that. Um, you know, those basketball greats, you know, especially uh, Coach Beheim, um, just want to soak all that up and um, it, it just learn how to deal with stuff and when you get in certain situations and, um, you know, when you get in crunch time, how are you going to talk to the players, you know, what play you're going to write up. And a big thing that he taught me was, uh, you know, just from watching him and how he handled stuff was, you know, his, his calm demeanor, uh, his patience, especially uh, in times where it can get intense and stressful. Um, and then and being able to – and then being able to, you know, um, deal with these guys, you know, it's, it's, it's a lot of different kids with a lot of different personalities, a lot of different egos. So uh, being able to handle all that, it, it can be tough sometimes. So um, you got to be able to have the, that relationship with the player um, to be able to get the best out of them. Um, so just, just learned a lot from that standpoint and dealing with guys and, um, you know, how to approach them, what, what, what buttons to push to, you know, to get the best out of them. Awesome. You played in the Big East Conference and you coached in the ACC. How do the two conferences differ? Um, well, for me, uh, you know, the Big East was, you know, the best conference. Uh, you know, the physicality, uh, you know, the talent, um, it, it just just how it was all set up. It was it was nothing like it. Um, you know, my freshman year, um, I just remember we, you know, we had I don't know how many top teams. It was UConn, Pittsburgh, Georgetown. You know, you had Cincinnati coming in. Um, so, you know, you had a lot of top teams. And, um, you know, obviously uh, the ACC is, is a great conference as well. But um, I'm going to be biased towards the, towards the old Big East. And, um, you know, I think that was one of the uh, greatest conferences ever assembled. So uh, the, the difference is um, I, I don't really know the difference. Maybe a little bit more physical uh, in the Big East. Now I can't really. Um, say too much because I haven't played in the ACC it's it's different from playing and watching um, but I'm always going to be uh, you know more biased towards the Big East for sure. I, I think every Syracuse fan here agrees with you on that one there's there's nothing like the good old Big East but talking about the ACC that that is where we are now and that is the future of Syracuse basketball what do you think this Syracuse basketball program of now needs to do to get back to that contending for a national championship or even conference championships they were very good back in 2014 with Tyler Ennis but still that was the first year in the ACC that was your still your Big East recruits basically what does Syracuse have to do to get back to that national status well I mean it, obviously we have the coaches and, and it all starts with the players right you, you got to get guys in there who, who are going to buy in and um you know, be willing to do what, what Coach Beheim asks of them. And, and you got to get guys who want to come in and compete, guys who are dogs, who, you know, who, who aren't worried about, um, you know, scoring this many points or getting this many minutes, guys who are going to come in and buy into that team role and, and go out there and, and compete every single minute as hard as they can. So, um, you know, the coaches we have, you, and we have the players as well. Now we just need to add a few more, a few more pieces, obviously. But, um, you know, we got to get players who want to compete um, and, and who want to buy in and who are just going to give it their all, um, you know, every minute that they're on that floor. Absolutely. Eric, last couple questions for you here before we wrap it up. Uh, what do you enjoy outside of basketball? We've spent this whole time talking about your basketball career, but you're a guy. What do you like to do outside of basketball? Uh, for me, I'm, I'm laid back, man. I'm, I'm a chill guy. So I, I like to, you know, spend time with my family and I got two daughters and a fiance. So, um, you know, just chill, watch movies, go to the movies. Obviously right now it's more, um, you know, it's, everything is in the house. So, yeah. um, but yeah, man, just, just spending that family time and uh, being able to watch them grow up. Absolutely. Lastly, Eric, this one's for all the fans out there. What does Syracuse mean to you? Uh, it means everything to me. I mean, it's uh, obviously I'm from Michigan, but um, you know, this is my home Syracuse and, and, you know, they took me in like one of their own. And um, still to this day, you know, when I have events or um, camps or clinics or whatever it is, um, the support uh, from the community is unreal. And um, you're not going to get that 
uh, really in any other community. So it, it's a special community to be a part of. Um, you know, I, I'm lucky and grateful to, um, you know, have played basketball at Syracuse University. And I think that just gives me a, you know, a platform to be able to do um, real good things here in the community. And, and like I said, um, when I'm able to do those things, um, the community backs me 100%. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm just real grateful for that and, uh, and, and how much they've done for me. That's awesome, Eric. We love you here so much in Syracuse. And uh, personally, I can't thank you enough for joining me here today. Uh, you know, I'm just 16 years old and uh, my dreams to go to SU, to Newhouse and become a big name sports broadcaster. And it all starts here. So uh, I just reached out to you on Twitter and you were willing enough to come on the show. And again, I can't thank you so much. This is a huge stepping stone for me and I really appreciate it. You're doing a good job, man. Continue to, you know, keep working and and doing what you're doing. And I'm, and I'm sure we'll uh, be seeing you on the big time in, in no time soon. <laughs> Thank you so much, Eric. Once again, ladies and gentlemen, number 23 in orange, Eric Devendorf for Giovanni Heater. And Eric Devendorf, we're out. <laughs>